Okay, we're looking at the Sermon on the Mount. We've been looking at it for, for several weeks. The Sermon on the Mount is in Matthew chapters 5, 6, and 7. It's Jesus Christ's most famous sermon. It's the one that establishes the, the basics of what it means to have life in Christ, the basics of what it means to live in the kingdom of God. They are eight attitudes that it begins with called the Beatitudes, eight core values that are then expanded on as you go the rest of the way through the Sermon on the Mount. Today, we are at Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Matthew 5, verse 8 says, blessed are, blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Other translations say, happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. It's that Greek word, makarios. We we spent a whole week on this um, a few weeks ago, where we looked at this idea of of happy being a a valid alternate word to put in there. And and sometimes, some of us may need to, to grab hold of that word happy as something that God wants us to use. Because he is saying, happy are the poor in spirit, happy are the gentle. Happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Happy are the pure in heart. It's the idea that that blessing and happiness are both from God. Blessing and happiness are both appropriate words to use in terms of what God wants for us. He is a God of blessing. Genesis starts with his his first declaration of what he does to mankind is bless them. And what happens when you get blessed? Well, you ought to be happy if you get blessed, right? So this is all a matter of not, not trying to get so hyper-spiritual that we say happy isn't a good thing. Happy's not deep enough. We need something deeper than happy. Well, fine and good, but don't throw happy out the window if it's what God says that he wants for us. So what does it mean today? Happy or the pure in heart? We need to look and consider what does it mean to be pure in heart so that we can be happy, so that we can be blessed, so that we can live life as God created us to to actually live life out. Pure in heart, let's break it down. Heart, first of all, what is that all about? Well, it's something we ought to pay attention to because the Bible, the Bible talks about the heart over 900 times. Over 900 times in the Bible, you've got this discussion of heart. I mean, you see an introduction to it in Jeremiah chapter 17, 9, where God says, the heart is deceitful above all things. There's nothing more rotten and deceitful than the human heart in its natural state, in its natural state. I mean, that whole idea that you hear bandied about today when you, when you hear people, non-Christians, say things like, well, I'm just following my heart, or 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 we're still where you tell people you ought to just follow your heart. That's like the worst advice in the history of advice to tell somebody to follow their heart, right? I mean, it's really dumb when God has said, it is the most deceitful thing about you and me, this, this unregenerated heart. Okay, this is the starting point. All of us start with a deceitful heart. All of us start with a heart that is predisposed to go in the wrong direction. But then, as you move forward in Ezekiel chapter 36, Ezekiel chapter 36, you've got God that starts looking forward to the coming of Jesus Christ, and he makes a promise there. He says, look, this is what's going to happen. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe my ordinances. I will put my... Do we have this right? No, I'm sorry. Back up. Verse 26. Ezekiel 37, verse 26. Moreover, I will give you a new heart, a new heart and put a new spirit within you, and I will remove the heart of stone from you, from your flesh, and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will be careful to observe all my ordinances. God's promising a new heart that's going to come. See, what he's talking about here is the package that comes with salvation, the package that comes in our conversion. We are saved by grace through faith. We are people, again, born with a deceitful heart, born with a hard heart, born separated from God. God has made provision for us to come into relationship with him. That comes by grace through faith in what Jesus did on the cross. Jesus Christ came, he died, he rose again from the dead, and as we look and believe that he died for us, taking our punishment, we're forgiven, we Avoid hell, we have heaven in front of us for eternity. That's great news. But part of the package is we become new creatures. There's a metaphysical transformation that happens where we become something new. And that newness involves a new heart, a soft heart to replace the hard heart, a good heart, a pure heart to replace 
the deceitful heart. We're given that new heart. We're given that new heart by God. It's a gift that comes from him. And then what we have is a responsibility to do something with it. Now again, what is the heart? Let's define it. There are all sorts of ways you can look at it, but a simple definition is this. The heart is the essence, it's the core of who you are. It's what you are in the secrecy of your own thoughts and feelings when nobody knows but God. That's the heart. That's what's going on. It, it's the idea that, that we are a combination of, of mind and spirit, of emotions and actions. All of these things kind of come together in this matter of, of the heart. What's pure? Well, the pure heart, what does that mean? First thing, let's get out of the way, it does not mean a perfect heart. It's not talking about perfection. It's not talking about a complete perfection. What it's talking about, rather, is a singleness of focus. A pure focus, meaning a singleness of focus towards God. No hypocrisy, no hidden or mixed motives. A pure heart is one that has the motive of pleasing God, that has the motive of obeying God, that has the motive of believing God in all things. Motives are, are powerful things, and we all have motives that are, are at work constantly in us. I mean, today, okay? Today, I get ready to come in and, and preach. And so, my motive in getting ready can be to serve you, to help you and myself, and to glorify God. That's, that's a possible motive. My motive can also be to look good or to just simply avoid humiliating myself. Now, one motive is pure. It's good. The other motive is what? It's self-serving. It's self-serving. And what happens in all of life is we've got these choices to make. We've got different directions we can go in in terms of our hearts, whether whether there's going to be that purity that comes through and we follow, or whether there's, there's something else. Motives are, are so powerful, and Jesus is addressing this. I mean, motives determine so much of what we do in life. And Jesus is addressing this right from the get-go as he introduces the kingdom and how the kingdom works. There's always a motive. There's always a motive in the way you're living. There's always a motive in every single choice we make. I mean, you don't have to think too much about that. It's, it's always going to be at, at, at play. Well, okay, let's jump into this whole idea of the pure heart, though. Blessed are, happy are those who are pure in heart, for they shall see God. Already said, new heart is given at conversion. So does that mean that we don't have anything else to worry about? I mean, if we've been given that new heart by God, then like ipso facto, we are going to be happy the rest of our lives. No, because Scripture has a lot more to say. We have been given a new heart. We've been given a clean heart. We've been given a soft heart, a heart of flesh. But what happens next? We have a stewardship responsibility over our own hearts. We have a responsibility to keep our heart. We have a responsibility to guard our heart. We have a responsibility to set our heart. The, the, the keeping of a pure heart is really, I think, where the primary emphasis was that, that Jesus had in, in the Beatitudes. It's about how we handle this new clean heart that, that we've been, been given. As with all of the Beatitudes, it's about the process of this, this new attitude growing in us. It's about the choices that we make in how we steward this thing we've been given, the, the pure heart. I mean, it's what Paul talks about in Philippians chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, where he says to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. Now, you look at the rest of the New Testament, salvation is given as a gift of grace from God. It's given as we've trusted what Jesus did. And salvation is not taken back by God. So why is it that we work it out with fear and trembling if we've already got it? Well, because we're supposed to do something with it. There's a stewardship responsibility that affects how this life is going to look and has some effect on the rewards that we get for eternity. This is the same thing with pure heart. You've been given a pure heart, and now we've got the responsibility, the duty, in terms of how to steward that heart and what to do with it. It involves, in large part, where we fix our heart, where we fix our attention, what our attitude is as we, we go through life. I mean, learning to set our heart is a big part of how we pursue 
a pure heart. It involves choosing what we pay attention to. It involves choosing every day what we pay attention to, and it's why that two people can be in exactly the same circumstances and their attitudes are completely different. It's why two followers of Jesus can be in exactly the same circumstances and head in two completely opposite situations. I mean, I I found a a great illustration that I've actually shared with you guys before that come from two diaries, the diary of a dog and the diary of a cat. (sighs) Reading the dog's diary, it goes like this. 8 a.m., dog food, my favorite thing. 9 a.m., car ride with my people, my favorite thing. 9.30, a walk, my favorite thing. 10.30, get petted. That's my favorite thing. 12 o'clock lunch, my favorite thing. 3 o'clock milk bones, my favorite thing. 8 o'clock watching TV with my family, my favorite thing. Cat diary. It's day 983 of my captivity. My (laughs) captors continue to taunt me with bizarre little dangling objects. The only thing that keeps me going is my dream of escape. I mean, okay. Silly, but so accurate. The idea, the idea here is that, that attitude makes all the difference in the world. Where the focus is, who the focus is upon, makes all the difference in the world in terms of what we do. We've been given this responsibility to steward our hearts. In Proverbs, Solomon, wisest guy besides Jesus who ever lived, said it this way, Proverbs 4.23. Above all else, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it. And just ponder that a second. It's a familiar verse to a lot of you, I know. But in this, in this verse, Solomon is, is in the middle of writing Proverbs here, and he's laid out hundreds of Proverbs, hundreds of sayings of wisdom. And what he says here is, above all of the other statements I've made, above all else, the most important thing, guard your hearts, because from the heart flow everything that's going to happen in life. From the motives that we have is going to flow what life looks like. He's saying the why of what we do comes from here, comes from the heart. The why is what matters. If we address the why, the what's can change. And this is what Jesus was saying. Take this pure heart you've been given and guard it. Take this pure heart you've been given and, and, and steward it easily. Uh, steward it better. The, 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 the interesting thing is, is this. Is this. It's actually easier to follow Jesus by following him with this full-on devotion of heart than it is to try to follow him half-heartedly. Now, some of you may have experienced this already. When you have one foot in and one foot out with Jesus. When you've got one foot in the world and one foot in, you don't fit anywhere. The world thinks you're crazy. People in in the church think you're a compromiser and you're confused all the time. I mean, I I know, I know. There are all kinds of issues where we do that, where we have this one foot in, one foot out, where we've got one foot in politics, one foot in, in, in the kingdom. We've got one foot in science and one foot in the kingdom. And I'm not saying we don't get involved in science, we don't get involved in politics, and we don't get involved in all of the issues of life in the world. But, but the complete and utter and full devotion we have has got to be in terms of what Jesus says. And that then affects everything else. It's so much simpler if we simply say, I'm all in with what Jesus said. In fact, again, I'm all about using the brain God gives us. But it's so much easier to go through life and say, you know, a lot of this stuff I don't even need to think about. I don't even need to try to figure it out. Jesus said do it, we do it. Jesus said don't do it, we don't do it. We don't have to get into some big discussion so often on so many of the minute issues of life because he's made it clear. We tend to get into a relativistic discussion thinking that that the, the standards that Jesus said, that Jesus set, vary with the circumstances. And that, 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 that circumstantial approach to truth is, is what leads to so much confusion, so much trouble, so much unhappiness. The, the deal is very simple. Purity brings clarity. Purity brings clarity. A purity of motive for God, a purity of, of motive in terms of going after what God wants us to go after, brings a simple clarity to life. And, and what does that do? It makes us happy. 
it puts us in a place where things are actually easier than, than they would otherwise be. Now, it's interesting, if you look at studies that have been done, huh? happiness trends have been on the decline since the 1960s. I mean, there are actually people that track this. Sociologists, not necessarily Christians, who track happiness trends. They've got a series of questions that they put out there in terms of gathering information on, on how happy people are, and the levels have been on the decline every year since the 1960s. What's interesting is the correlation of the decline in happiness, the correlation with the sexual liberation of the 1960s. What happened in the 1960s, I was around then, I don't know if you were or not, but what happened in the 1960s is there, there was a reversed moral uh, consensus around promiscuity sexually. Uh, there was a, a situation then with that reversed consensus around promiscuity that worked towards the legalization of abortions, which then moved to the legalization of no-fault divorce, which came up in the 1960s, which moved to Tinder of today and a hookup culture that separates completely sex from a relationship. I mean, can you see the progress that's been made or the regression that's happened? That's moved on to the LBGTQ uh, revolution and separated sex from the male-female binary that, that, you know, in the 50s would have sounded cartoonish to people as they, they heard it. But, but then what happens is we look at it and the argument continues to be made that this has brought freedom, that the freedom should always bring happiness. And of course, the consensus is, whether you're Christian or not Christian, that happiness is on the decline. Now, what I'm proposing here is not the legalization of morality. I'm not proposing that statutes need to be put in play. I'm proposing the idea that we need to understand that freedom, freedom comes as we walk out life as God has told us to walk it out. That bondage comes as we try to go into an alternate path of living. And what our focus needs to be is not on trying to change the morality of people who are secular, but, but living a life that shows what purity, meaning a motive that goes after God. That's all we're talking about now, right? A motive that goes after what God wants of setting an example of what that looks like and the results it brings and then hopefully having opportunities opened up to then present the gospel and saying, look, this is what happened to me. This is what Jesus did for me. This is the new heart I was given. This is what happens with the new heart that I have. It puts us in a place, hopefully, of having a credibility as people see that, yeah, they actually are different. Now, again, the essence of the gospel is not necessarily your changed life, but it's a nice thing to be able to throw in the mix as you present the truth of who Jesus is and what he did. It's a nice thing to be able to throw in as, as additional evidence on the reality and truth of, of who God is and, and the plans that, 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 God, that God has. Again, what's happened is the, the decline in happiness levels today correlates with this reversal of, of a consensus around moral virtues that were previously called traditional values. They're spoken of disdainfully sometimes, traditional values. Those values of, you know, one man, one woman in a relationship of marriage. Those values of not having sex outside of marriage. Those values, and the list goes on and on. The question is, the question is, where did these traditional values come from? How did the tradition of these values come into existence in the first place? And the answer is, Sermon on the Mount is what started them. Sermon on the Mount is where traditional values came into play. Because when Jesus presented these things initially, when Jesus came introducing the kingdom and the loss of the kingdom, if you want to call it that, he presented something that was not traditional at the time. What Jesus presented was completely countercultural because what Jesus presented was something that dealt with matters of the heart. Now think about it again. What, what was the environment in which Jesus stepped? Jesus stepped into a religious environment, but the religious environment was all about the external things that people did. Holiness was gauged by what you did not by what was in your heart. Jesus flipped everything around. He said it's about the heart. He said it's about the motives. He said it's about the secret things that go on. It's about the whys that are there. And the whys will then bring real revolution in the whats that come out and how we live. It's the idea that he established those, again, 
as values that were not traditional, that became known as traditional as people followed them for centuries. And why did people follow them for centuries? Because they worked. Because they worked. That's why they followed them for centuries. Because God gave a map in, in terms of reality, in terms of what really works, in terms of what really makes life work and the world work with, with the, way, the way that it's supposed to. And so what, what's our call? Our call today is to be agents of revival. Now, if you're part of the Christian community, that word revival is bandied about all the time, and it's a call for, most often, getting them saved. It's a call for getting those people to change the way they live. It's a call for maybe having our country changed by instituting biblical laws. You know, I think that's like the worst idea in the world, honestly. Revival starts with my heart changing. Revival starts with you thinking to yourself, my heart needs to change. It needs to start with a purity of my heart, with a purity of my motives that come into play. And then that reviving as it spreads out among dozens, hundreds, thousands of believers on the big island in the state of Hawaii, as it spreads out, then what happens from the overflow of hearts that have been transformed, from people who already have pure hearts that then start guarding that pure heart, that then start keeping that pure heart, that then start stewarding it the way we're supposed to, from the overflow of that, the gospel goes out with a credibility that it never had before. And then, yeah, people are saved and things change. But again, it, it starts with what we do with it. It's, it's the way, the way that, that I think Jesus laid it out for us. So, okay, let's look at some how-tos real quickly. Some specifics in terms of how to keep a pure heart. These are maybe somewhat random, but I, I think they're, they're essential in terms of how to guard our heart, how to keep a pure heart. You want to just look at three real quickly. Number one, number one, to guard our heart, to keep a pure heart, we've got to pe- be people who are quick to believe, quick to believe. We need to be, number two, people who are quick to forgive. And we need to be, number three, people who are quick to repent. When I'm saying quick to believe, it means learning how to have yes God as our default position. Having yes God as our default attitude. When we look at a command, when we look at a promise that God has made in Scripture, yes God. Yes God is what we want to be able to say. I mean, we may not be the brightest kids around, but I want God to say of me, no, Bill, you may not be the the sharpest tool in the tool shed, but you always say yes quickly. And this is where we want to be. People who are, are quick to believe, and that means to watch out for cynicism, to watch out for the cynicism that so easily enters in. It's been something that's entered in for 2,000 plus years since Jesus Christ rose from the dead. But it's at a higher level now than I suspect it's ever been before. A cynicism that comes in that questions promises, that questions the supernatural, that questions the reality of who God is and what God does, that questions the reality that Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father except through him. It's a cynicism that we need to watch out for in all the forms in which it can come in. And we need to be, again, intentionally doing what we have to do to be people who are quick to believe. Number two, that matter of being quick to forgive means watching out for bitterness that comes in. Watching out for the bitterness that comes in that will keep our hearts in bondage. That bitterness that comes in that that will pollute that that pure heart that we're supposed to have. The forgiveness that's to come in, we watch out for the bitterness that, that puts us in a place where we're not forgiving with the forgiveness with which we've been forgiven. And then finally, being quick to repent. It's, it's developing the discipline. And it's, uh, for me, it's a discipline. I don't know about how it works for you. The discipline, discipline of being quick to repent. You get into an argument with somebody, your wife. You get into, you know, any kind of issue where something's going on wrong. The first thing you do is what? Well, hopefully it's not justify your position. Hopefully it's not shift the blame to what they did or they should have done. Hopefully the first thing you do is to find out what part you to play and played. And 100% of the time, when I look at it, I played a part in it. And so I repent. I want to repent. And, and I think I do. Repent for the part I played in it. Don't shift the blame. Have the first thing that you do 
is to move into what you need to own and what you need to turn from. That's the idea. If we, if we are people that, that do those three things, being quick to believe, quick to forgive, quick to repent, we're going to go a long way towards that, that matter of stewarding, of guarding, of keeping that pure heart and understanding that it's something important because purity is potent. Purity is powerful. Purity pleases the Father. It says, what's the promise that's coupled with keeping a pure heart? You see God. You see God. Does that mean like visually you're going to have visions of, of, you know, the father on the throne? Maybe, but I think what it means is you see clearly the things of God. You see clearly the things God wants. You see, you hear clearly what God has for you as the next step. I mean, if you don't have, if I don't have the purity of heart, if, if there are mixed motivations coming in, if there's anything that's, that's drawing my attention away, that's, that's more important to me than pleasing the Father, then in that instant, that thing is the God of my life. It, it's the idea, again, that, that as, we, as we look and focus in on what he wants, we're going to have this, this matter of, of clearly, more clearly seeing this. The pure heart has a deep desire to please God in everything we do. It's very similar to the fear of God. The, the pure heart always is open to the Holy Spirit's leading to, to grow and, and to change. The, the pure heart is, is just waiting for God. I mean, I think one of the best examples of a group of people who were of a pure heart is in Acts chapter 2. What you see is Jesus has told his disciples to wait for the Holy Spirit to come. So you got 120 of them, about 120 of them, in the upper room. They're, they're waiting for the Holy Spirit to come, Acts chapter 1. And then you move into Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit comes. And the Holy Spirit fills them. And they're speaking in tongues. And they're preaching the gospel. And people are looking at them going, they are weird folk. They are, they're drunk. I mean, they used all sorts of, of indications on, on what, what they were. But what were they actually? They were people who were humble and hungry. They were pure in heart in that sense of single-minded purpose in seeking God. That's all they were after. They had seen Jesus Christ resurrected from the dead. They had seen him ascend to heaven. That kind of got their attention, right? And with that as their focal point of reality, with that person who they had seen levitating up through the clouds, telling them, wait for the Holy Spirit, what do you think they did? They waited for the Holy Spirit. They did it with a single-minded focus. And the Holy Spirit comes. And the Holy Spirit falls upon them. When Pentecost comes, this is an interesting little part to consider. Pentecost came, and it was perhaps the only meeting of Christians that has ever occurred where they didn't know enough to get it wrong. They didn't know enough to get it wrong. What, 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 what happens now if you have a Holy Spirit meeting? You got people doing all sorts of weird, stupid, crazy things because they've heard of this model or this method or this thing, you know, that ought to be coming into, into appearance here. And so they, they, they try to manipulate the situation to make it happen. And, and at Pentecost, they had no idea what this was going to look like when the Holy Spirit came, right? They didn't know what form it was going to take. They didn't know there were going to be tongues of fire alighting on each of their heads. They didn't know they were going to get the gift of tongues. They didn't know what was going to happen. And so all they did was with a single-minded focus, pursue God and pursue whatever it was that God had for them. Again, I don't know exactly what that's going to look like for us or what it should look like for us other than don't, don't create walls within which God's got to work. Don't create limitations in terms of, of how he's going to, to do what he's going to do, but we seek him with a full heart. Jeremiah 29, 13 says we're going to seek him and we're going to find him when we do it with all of our hearts. I mean, summing it all up, summing it all up, being pure in heart, maintaining this purity of heart means being a, a Bible-believing Jesus freak, old school nut who just goes all in for the things of the gospel. It's something where people will call you ignorant. It's something where people will say that you're narrow-minded. It's something where people will say sometimes even that, that you're, you're, you're not appearing to be very loving. And you say, well, there is something finally we can agree upon because that's who we're supposed to be. Not unloving, but but the way it's going to look sometimes as we do what we're supposed to do, it's going to have that, that appearance to people. So, this week, what do we do? Application. As I said last week, 
when we come together, if, if you don't leave with a do, then I haven't done something that I'm supposed to do or you're not listening to what you're supposed to do. There's got to be a do to it. We aren't supposed to be people who simply know. We do with what Scripture says. We do with what Jesus has laid out. So how do we do this thing of handling the pure heart? Number one, you've got to first get the pure heart. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior... Talk to one of the prayer ministry team. Talk to me. Love to be able to talk to you about any questions you have about the gospel and, and what it means to receive Jesus by faith. And then get baptized next week. Number two, number two, one of the things that you have to do in, in guarding your heart and keeping up your heart is to do some memory management. You've got to understand that, that you weren't born with this pure heart. It was given to you. And so before you got it, you really screwed up in life. And you need to understand that, that there is not to be any guilt for what happened before you got the new heart. There's not to be any, any condemnation that comes in. There's not to be any shame that you carry about what happened in the past. Those things are paid for. Those things are forgiven through what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Do some memory management with it. Things that happen post-salvation actually fall into the same category. You fess it up. You confess what happened. You, you repent. And the forgiveness that you were given through what Jesus did on the cross, is sufficient to carry you through all the days of, of this life. Number three, you stay single-minded by feeding the single thing. How do you feed the single thing? How do you feed the motive of, of pleasing God, of following after God? By knowing what God wants. By, by making sure that, 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 that Scripture, that, that the things that speak of the will of God are the preeminent things in, in your life and in your mind. I mean, I, I know I'm beating the same drum over and over again each week, but if you spend five times as much time on social media and watching news feeds as you do considering the words of God, I'm not saying reading the Bible constantly for hours at a time, but, but being immersed in the consideration of the things of God, then, then you're not going to be able to walk with a purity of heart. What comes in is going to affect what our heart looks like. Input determines the, the purity that's going to be there. And we need to watch out for that input as, as it comes in. And that involves keeping the right relationships in place. I mean, harsh thing to say, but some of, of us, some of you, need to cut off some relationships that you're involved in. Because those, not talking about your husband and your wife, talking about other relationships, but those relationships that, that can be dragging you into discussions you shouldn't have, that drag you into worry and anxiety and fear that you shouldn't be involved in. I mean, and you know when those things come up, you need to be with people that are going to encourage you, that are going to speak truth into your life, that are going to speak the realities of what God wants coming into your life. And, and we, we watch these things. We examine our hearts to determine it. I mean, if you haven't done it lately, go in for a heart examination this week. You and the Holy Spirit. I mean, most of you probably go to the doctor at least once a year, or once every couple of years. And what's the main thing they do? They take your blood pressure. They listen to your heart. They want to know whether that physical heart is beating strongly. And you're a little concerned about it too, probably. You want to find out, is it going to last me a little bit longer? Well, truth is, it's not going to last you too much longer. It's going to quit beating at some point. So, yes, there needs to be consideration of the physical heart, but there needs to be a lot more consideration of the spiritual heart that we have, that core of our being. And the examination needs to come into play, where we actually sit down and do a little examining of ourselves, where we're, we're looking at what are the motives here? What are really the motives that move me? What are really the motives that make me do what I do, say what I say, be with who I'm choosing to be with? And, and ask the Holy Spirit to, to bring into focus that, that clarity of reality. And, and as that happens, as that happens, be, be ready with the power that the Holy Spirit gives you as a person who has the Holy Spirit in them to change, to do that metanoia, the changing of mind that Jesus will empower. As we do it, what happens? We have a pure heart, we'll see God. As we do it, what happens? We start revival. We become catalysts for revival in our family, in our community, and through these islands of Hawaii. As we do it, we, we put ourselves in a place where we can expect to stand before that throne on the final day and hear 
well done, good and faithful servant. And that's what we need to be looking forward to. Father, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you for the revelation of your word. And we thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are available to enable us to do what many right now think is impossible. You, Holy Spirit, enable us to do what we can't do in our own strength. And I ask you to come now, Holy Spirit, in a fullness of power as you break us to whatever degree we need to be broken free, free from lies, free from the lies of the enemy, the deceit from our own heart, the the lies of the world, and enable us to step fully into that, that truth of who you are, Father, to step fully into a pursuit of the purposes that you have for us as, as representatives of your kingdom during, during this age. All of it, Father, we ask in the power of Jesus Christ's name. Amen.